change of style. Should've never been allowed to get all your fake asses out. We should've done it with me. Make some noise if you're feeling me. I was working in a record shop right outside the city, Street Corner Music. That was like the first platform I had at retail for selling records. And Jay came in one day and he was just digging and going through records and he struck up a conversation and he got to talking. This, this was right before like all the tribe shit went down. Like it was kind of in negotiations about him putting the work in for them. And uh, he played me some shit. He's driving a white Ford Ranger and he put a tape in and I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what's up right here. I first found out about him through House Shoes. I actually I put out a record called Peanut Butter Breaks in 1994, and House Shoes was working at a record store, and I was sending the records to him, and he was like, "Oh, you got to hear my man Dilla." You know, he was just always he was really holding the torch for this guy who I'd never heard of. You know, didn't have anything out, and um, he was just really proud of him. That it was this guy from Detroit that was making music, you know, that's so powerful. They came through with the Fantastic Volume 1 cassettes, brought me like 20 of them. And it, this spot would be greasy at times, like, you know, it'd be backdoor shit going on. And what I would usually do is, if it was somebody that I really wanted to have it, I'd just slide it in the bag. And then, you know, when it comes time to take out a consignment, oh, look, all 20 tapes are gone, you're getting paid for them anyway. So these cats from Manhattan Records were in town. Which meant at that time, Manhattan Records in, in Japan was like the biggest record store in the world. And uh, we were chopping it up and I gave him the tape. And from, from that handoff, you know, that's how the fantastic I Don't Know 12 Inch came about. I went to Japan and I was on tour with, uh, with the Visionaries. Uh, Babu and myself were going record shopping and we happened to go to Manhattan Records. And they would do a lot of exclusive stuff from the United States that only sell in Japan. Uh, the buyer at the time, the hip hop buyer at the time, his name was Toshi. Toshi says, yo, you know, ever you know, heard of JD? Say, yeah, 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 you know, like, you know, he has a group called Slum Village. It's like, ah, so he plays a record. First thing he played was I Don't Know. And we were like, Babu and I were like bugging the hell out, like how he would flip, how he used James Brown within the, with the song, you know, I don't know, T, three, one, two, you know, like just in, in, in playing and stuff. Personally, I bought like at least about 15 or 20, bring back home with me. I pretty much, hooked up the crew with, with the vinyl and stuff, and then the junkies were, were, were the pretty much the ones that broke Slum Village in LA. For some reason, they just took to it out here. Toronto and Los Angeles were like the first two markets outside of Detroit that really got on it, and that's because they're, like I said, hip-hop-wise, LA has always been way ahead, you know, with like Freestyle Fellowship and Blow, just like lyrically way ahead of the game. And uh, in Toronto, they just they just love good, good hip-hop. The production on all the early Slum Village stuff I just immediately grabbed my attention. It was like, what the hell is this? You know, this is this is like a dream come true for uh, hip hop music. Uh, my boy Jake One, he used to always give me Dilla stuff. He used to, he had a link. I don't know who his link was, like House Shoes and a couple other people. But back then, like 96, 95, early 97, um, there was already a community of Dilla heads. Like, you know, there was already people, yo, I got, this dude JD's new beat tape, or I got his new demo, or you know, so so that stuff was already floating around. Like that's that's how Dilla would shop beats, is he would make beat tapes, you know, not not too dissimilar to what Donuts is, you know, like right. a, 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 you know a, a compilation of minute long ideas, musical ideas that could be turned into songs. And so Jay got his hands on a bunch of the ones from the, I guess it would have been the early 2000s or the late 90s. I told Malib I had one, and he just like, yo, you got a what? So I dubbed it for him, and he just went and went and made a bunch of songs over those beats. Madlib got a hold of a lot of uh, Dilla tapes and started rapping over Dilla's beats. And we came up with this idea, because I was working on a mixtape, and this is before Serato, and I, and I came up with the idea to, to do like a, a vinyl so that I can like mix and scratch with it. And I, I put one song of theirs on it, and we did like, 200 copies or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I remember hearing some of the first results, like the the, 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 the stereo lab chop and uh, the one that Busta Rhymes wrapped over subsequently and uh, just being blown away. Just hearing Madlib. I mean, Madlib's a great MC, but he, he, you know, this is like Dilla, you know, like two, two really good MCs, but 
not always rapping. I mean, more making beats. But uh, here, my love over Dilla sounded sound real good. We didn't even tell Dilla, actually, you know, when we did it. And Dilla called me up afterwards, and he's all, yo, what's up with that bootleg, man? And I wasn't sure if he was like, what's up, like I'm pissed off at you or what's up, you know? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, cause I'm doing this, this mix and I needed the song. And he was like, yo man, let's, let's do some shit like that, but official. So we came up with the idea of Madlib rapping over Dilla Beats for half the album and Dilla rapping over Madlib Beats for the other half. Now, I, I, as a DJ, you know, was, was just waiting. Um, once I began to hear from Egon and Havana Joe about what was going on and people were just talking about, oh yeah, you know, I just heard some stuff the other day. A J-Rock would talk about, you know, oh, I heard something and man, it was crazy and this and that. And I mean, it was, it was exciting because the only thing that could happen was, was some sort of a, a meeting of the minds that, that would influence the two of them together. Emotionally, they both speak from a similar kind of place. I think in their music, that's what makes them better, different than most of the other cats that touch a drum machine. You know, is that they're able to reach emotional places with their music that other cats don't, don't get to. He had sent some, he had sent like the 2002 batches is five volumes with like 25 beats on each of them. He had sent them to Mad Lib. Get a knock on the door, UPS man shows up with an envelope. He opens it up, it's a CD, takes it out, puts it in, and it's like 15 songs. And we were trying to figure it out because he said that he sent Madlib the beat, the beat tapes like three or four days ago. So we were just trying to figure out how it was humanly possible for somebody to do that. And when he was, you know, sending the stuff back and forth with Madlib, we didn't expect in any way that he was going to pick the beats that he picked. So we were all sitting around in the basement and uh, we were listening to these beats. And I mean, it's Mad Lib beats, you know what I mean? Like, so there's some bangers on it. Like, it was some stuff on there that was just like, holy crap. Like, a lot of the stuff that ended up with on the J Lib record, you know what I mean? Like, bangers. And McNasty Phil, while it was a good beat, it just wasn't one of the ones that, that immediately struck us. Like, ah! Oh! And, and for Dilla, I think a lot of times making records was about the challenge. CD came back from Dilla in the FedEx, and I was like, Madla, what, what the fuck? Why did he pick that? And I was like, you know, but it's dope, you know? And it was dope. It was like, you know, kind of like sends chivers down your spine dope, you know, like that he chose all those beats. And Madlib's picking all these beats that kind of referenced the Dilla that had made all the money, you know, revolutionizing commercial hip hop and ne neo soul or whatever. You know, but Dilla was there picking shit that didn't sound anything like the stuff he was, he was, you know, known for making. And then he started actually doing shows with us out of town. And that was another thing where like, I never, wanted to ask him to do shows because I knew even that back then his health was like off and on, you know? And um, he he was like really like encouraging us like that he was down to do the shows and stuff. And he was, I mean, we did a lot of shows with him before he moved to LA, you know, and they were all really special. And I think just that energy like kind of gave him the, the need to move here too. Shit kind of went sour though, cause uh, you know he had a flood that destroyed a lot of shit. So I've I've been a victim of like three or four floods. So when that happens, it's kind of like it's like it never has that that feeling that it had. You're like, damn, like my shit got my shit got destroyed. Like let me get on some new shit. So you think that's why he moved to LA? That was probably one of the reasons. Eventually, one day he just called me up and he's like, Wolf, I'm moving to LA. I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> You know, like I, I could not, because he was just always repping the D so hard, you know, and it was just such a part of him. Dilla was synonymous with Detroit for all of us, and all of us kind of regarded him as a mythic figure, even though Wolf had, you know, of course, done some work with him. He put out those bootleg remixes when he was at uh, TRC, and of course, I'd met him, and you know, I think Madlib had even met him or something. But he was still like this mythic figure that was all Detroit, and you know, he would pop into these different cities, but you know, he was clearly Detroit. You know, when you get older, you look for a certain type of vibe to do what you do. You know what I'm saying? Things got to be a certain way. And maybe Detroit just didn't have it for him anymore. He had used it up. According to my dukes, 
think he was kind of tired of Detroit. You know, Detroit was a real struggle for him. It was hard for him to stay there. The Detroit should have wear you out. I mean, I'm same thing. You know, I had to get that get out of there too. It can just kind of suck the life out of you. Out of all the times that I've been there, I think I've seen the sun once. You know, and it wasn't even for that long. You know, it's either snowing, raining, or overcast. Period. That's the D. Cats get tired of that cold and in the winter and the rain and all that shit. And they just want to get as far away as possible without leaving the country and come out here and just just get the love that they never got in their own city. You know, I mean, musicians throughout the history, like way before hip hop, the same shit's been going on for a long time. Whether you look at Marvin Gaye, the whole Motown scene, even before that, you go back to the era of cats like Paul Humphrey. But it's 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 a there's a there's a there's a you know, there's a railroad for musicians between Detroit and Los Angeles that's existed for many generations. Well, Motown had offices in Detroit and L.A. I mean, you know, come on now. You know, there, there's, like the electro scene, you know, in L.A. was humongous. That's how hip-hop started here was via electro. There wasn't much disco rap being made in Los Angeles, right? And, you know, even what's big was over here where DJ used to do doubles, cut it up and stuff, was uh, uh, Cybertron. Uh, the song was called Clear. And a lot of people don't know that that uh, Cybertron is one Atkins, a, a, a famous uh, tic, uh, Detroit techno producer. They had the electro thing kind of going with the parallels to like Cybertron and an Egyptian Lover. Like um, Juan Atkins and Egyptian Lover are good friends, and they they were kind of making the similar music, even though geographically it's so far away. So you know there was that going on in the early '80s and mid '80s, and with Dylan and Madlib, you know, I think they, they, they kind of continued that tradition. I mean, I honestly think that Madlib was a big reason why he moved here, and you know, I, I never talked to him about it, and um, there's no way to confirm or deny that, but that's just like how I felt about it. Dilla and Madlib had this, you know, energy that they shared, and it was obvious when they were doing the JLib project that the music they were sending back and forth was influencing the music that they were making. A lot of that was vocal performances, but you know, subtly you could hear it in the beats that Dilla would send through, you know, in the beats Madlib would send, you know, to Dilla. And one of the tracks on the the J Lib record that always struck me as something that was influenced by Madlib was the uh, that beat that Percy P rapped over for that interlude on the record. You know, chopped up drums, like you know, super distorted vocal exclamations coming in and out. That reminded me of something, you know, that Madlib had influenced, and that interchange kicked into high gear when he moved to L.A. Him and that Madlib hung out a little bit more, got into each other's styles a little bit more. Those those guys are like, they're like cousins, you know, they're like, they're, they're like almost mirror image of each other, you know, in some ways yin and yang, like Dilla's a little bit more outspoken than, than Madlib and stuff, but, they're, but they're, their spirits are the same. It's, it's like it's, I even just remember just chilling in the back, I remember, I forgot what show it was, and we're chilling in the back. You hear Dilla go, yeah. And then you hear Madlib going, whoo, just whoo, you know, just one word, but they all communicate already exactly how, they, you know, they're just like, you know, they be like giving each other pounds and then just smoke and just like, eh, eh, laugh, eh, you know, just, just, they don't have to have full conversation. It is almost like you watch them, they already know how, they already, they already know what they're talking, you know, thinking already, you know, they're just like, eh, you know, like, it, it's funny. I think they're both kind of, we're aliens as far as like, they're just really out of this world. I mean, and nobody makes music as well as they do. And I think Dilla felt like, wow, if there's finally a guy that I can relate to, you know, it's like, I think when you're that talented, you get really lonely. Like there's nobody else on earth that can relate to you. Or, and they just, um, they, yeah, they just had that music bond that was like really strong. I think, I think mentally it just kind of freed his mind, you know? Like a different, it's a, a easier way, a better way of life out here compared to where we were. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, I think he, um, I think it just freed him up to be able to kind of think like, man, I can do whatever I want to do, even if I want to go back, because it was hard for him to go backwards. You know what I'm saying? Like, he likes staying ahead of the curve, but you know, donuts, which really loops and breaks. You know, I think moving out here from Detroit and leaving the studio behind him, you know, like a very fine, beautiful studio with a very 
killer Pro Tools setup um, that he had built up over time and taken a lot of that record company money and put it into the studio and then leaving that behind, I think, freed him up then to do the kind of work that he did when he was out here, which was much more like choppy, you know, sample oriented, um, just really about ideas. He'd already done so much with so many different artists as far as defining the Dilla sound before that, that I think he was probably sick of it at that point. And he was ready to just change things enough that he was gonna define a new era. And so, yeah, he moved here, he limited himself to just the bare basics uh, as far as tools that he needed. I think he was playing around with, you know, an MPC. I think he had a, a Korg Electribe drum machine that he brought over to my house a couple times and he was really excited about that. Um, you know, turntables, just some basic sampling and maybe a couple keyboards. By the time I had started working with him, which was J-Lib, he was already starting to go for uh, a raw, he, you know, he kept on wanting to go for that raw sound and that's what he talks about in Donuts and J-Lib and everything else and everything was just more lo-fi, more hard hitting, less point on the drums, less um, gating on everything and cleaning everything up. He wasn't really going for that at that point. It was let the noise bleed, let things sound, you know, uh, damaged and more destroyed and that was kind of where he was coming from at that point. Yeah, he was just on, out here, he was just on a different phase, just on his loops. He was on chopping breaks and finding loops. He wasn't on his keyboard beats anymore. He wasn't on, he wasn't on any of that. He was just on some straight hip hop, find the record, dig it out, let me chop it. You know, he was on that vibe at that time. For him, he was always on to the next. He didn't hold on to anything. You know what I'm saying? He kind of let it all go at some point. Like, you know, this batch of beats is cool. And I think it, it bothered him the most because people would call him about something he did three months ago. And he would be like, ah, man, they want this old ass beat. I don't even want to fuck with this beat right now. It's like old to me. Like, because he had moved on three or four steps from where he was to where, he, you know, where he was going in that time. Get on one page and he would conquer that. And he would be satisfied and then he would move on to the next and he wouldn't look back. It was always no looking back with Jay. Like I did that, I'm done with it. Let's get, let's go five years ahead. You know, he was very good at knowing when he had played enough cards for one sound and you know, enough people were copying him at that point that it was time to switch it. And so he was trying new things out and he wanted to go more lo-fi, muffly, I, I love that he kept saying that. Um, more like a cassette, you know? But, you know, at, at around that time, he'd put out the Rough Draft record. So he'd kind of made a statement, at least to, you know, the people that were paying attention to that vinyl-only release, that, you know, he was kind of taking a left turn. But he's one of those dudes you can take any record. I know Erica Badu tells a story of, like, he would just say, like, pick any record, I'll make a beat out of it. And he, he was one of them dudes. Like, it was like, he needed, he needed the history of recorded sound, but within that, if it was a 29th, it, it, it could be rare or it could be not that rare. He took from all sources. I mean, he would take from techno records, you know, and and he would take from like really obvious thing, obvious artists, but maybe a song that they didn't know. And then he would take from obscure stuff too. But I, I don't think he was like really like, he, do, you know, he would take from the Bee Gees or from whatever. It, it wasn't all about like, oh, it's gotta only be something rare. When Dilla grabbed that Stereo Lab beat, you know, I remember at the time, you know, B Plus was the one hipping us to, he's like, man, you guys don't listen to Stereo Lab? I'm like, man, that's the shit that the fucking kids at my college radio station listen to. Like, I'm, I'm playing boom bap hip hop, man, or funk. And he's like, you should check this out. And I was like, fuck, man, Stereo Lab? And you know, Dylan was grabbing from, you know, much more current stuff than that, right? You know, like, so he was, he was grabbing from everything. And Madlib was the same way. Like, I remember first time I saw like a Vincent Gallo record in Madlib's like to be sampled stack, I'm like, you're sampling Vincent Gallo, you know, but it all made sense because it's just like, you know, no boundaries, you know, it was just the way those guys worked. One thing I did laugh about was him like, I gotta find this hand clap and then go into the closet and he had a record, he already knew exactly um, the record, yeah, it's got an ill hand clap on it and then sampled it up. He thought like how you, how you hear about Amadeus explained, you know, how he would just have everything mapped out in his head before he even composed a note on paper. Dilla was the same way, he had the whole thing mapped out in his head before he even got going. You know, we'd sit there for 15 minutes doing drops on a song and it would just be, okay, right there, next bar, drop out, you know, drop out the kit, next bar, next four bars later, 
drop out the bass yep right there but bring it in right before the hi-hat yep that's it move to the next eight bars he would just go through it like a railroad man he would just cut through it and it was amazing watching him work because i could barely keep up with just the pro tools operating <laughs> 80 to 90 percent of all these joints that people have heard 15 minutes 15 20 minutes tops the first beat i ever saw him make was get a hold off of beats rhymes in life and uh, that's when he was working in the back room at rj rice's studio in southfield and it probably took him about 12 minutes to make and he was getting frustrated like he was getting like he was getting frustrated on the drums like damn, damn, damn. and finally got him and then just to, to chop the to chop the loop up and then put it on top took him like two three minutes you know what i'm saying Sometimes with the plugins and Pro Tools, things would get a little out of sync between my system and his system because I had a, a TDM system and he had uh, an LE system. Um, this is kind of technical stuff, but you know, things would fall out of time because the plugins wouldn't be exactly the same between our systems. And he would be sitting on the couch and he'd be like, ah, something fell out. And he'd go, you know, move the bass back two baby hairs, you know? And so I'd, I'd nudge the bass and he'd be, that's good. And, Move the snare back one baby hair. I'm like, okay. Now the vocals. Move them all back three baby hairs. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm trying to interpret what baby hairs are, but I'm going ahead and doing it. Okay, what do you think of that? Yeah, cool. One more baby hair. Cool. He's like, that's it. <laughs> and sure enough, you listen to it, and the whole beat, like, you know, it, it felt like a little crooked beforehand before he got his hands on it and his ears on it. But by the time, you know, exactly one minute later everything was time aligned without him having to sit at the at the board and do it himself you know but he just had crazy ears he could sense timing very very accurately and zero in on the stuff very quickly and fix it he was always like giving us beat tapes and he was making kind of jokey names for him one of them was like pizza man and one was donuts and it was always like this unhealthy food and stuff but donuts was one of them and he, I just remember it was me and Mad Lib and him in the car, and we were, he just, he was like, yeah, here's my new stuff, or whatever, you know, we were always like, wanted to hear, or I was always wanted to hear his and Mad Lib stuff, and um, he played it, and I wasn't sure if it was like supposed to be a beat tape for rappers or what it was supposed to be, but it was, um, to me, it just sounded like the songs were full, finished songs, and I said, we should put this out like as it is, and he's all, I'm with it, you know. Chris always said, you know, it's gonna be, a way for you know him to get his beats out there again and you know people are going to realize that yeah he's sick but you know he's not out for the count you know he's still making incredible beats because they're just getting shared around the internet and no one really knows how how great they are we're going to master and mix them and all that and he took that project really seriously i mean he was editing stuff in in the hospital all the time you know he might have even made some of the beats there but i kind of doubt it you know he had the the portable turntable and he had the 45s and all that but I don't recall him ever sampling this stuff. I just remember him always with the laptop editing this stuff on Pro Tools. When he turned in that record, he gave me two CDs. I still have one of them. One of them I brought to production, one of them I kept at my house. And it's the original Donuts as he made it because Jeff went and edited Donuts. That was you know, a funny story in and of itself, but Jeff had to extend it because it was hella short. It was like 20 minutes long or something like that. And when I heard all of that together in the way that he actually wanted it to come out, I was like, Fuck me, man. This <laughs> last couple years has just completely flipped music on its head once again. Like, there's no way that anybody's gonna know what to do with this. It was just, it was so astronomically different than everything that everybody had tried to do with that source material. If Donuts is like his most deceptive album because it sounds so simple and so easy. I mean, if you just, if you were just to listen to it at like the most basic level, it's, it's, you know, basically soul loops, you know, but if you were to go back and try to redo some of the stuff that he did, it's like there's so much more to it than, than meets the eye. And then, you know, he, he threw in all these amazing hidden messages in there, here and there, and it was so complicated and so complex and so well thought out, but, but it was still, you know, anybody could get down to it, you know. When I first heard it, I think with a lot of us, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, man, this shit is crazy. It's real minimal, like just sticking to the records, kind of almost like edits of the original joints. But when he passed, you know, with a lot of us, the shit took on a whole new meaning. Like, was he really that nuts to like basically 
make a goodbye letter. You know, that shit is like saying goodbye. For artists like this, you know, like like death at the height of your powers is one of those things where it's like, um, you know, to find a full stop in the middle of the sentence is one of those things that just makes people think about things in a whole different way. And to put mortality into the mix in terms of your art, yeah, I mean, listen to Donuts, you know. Do you really think the dude didn't know what was going to happen? He fully knew what was going to happen. It's a lot of the original tracks that he sampled if you listen to the lyrics and like the song titles, it's it's kind of like it's really dark. Like it's a lot of speaking of about about of about death and and uh, even the, like the snippets that he put on top and the way he cut the records to make them sound like something else. Like Jadakus cutting on Jadakus and making it sound like he's saying, "Is death real?" When he was saying like, "Is that real?" You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's crazy. He consistently like with each project he ever produced it would just, it would crack your head, like, this isn't, he's one of a kind, there's no one else that could, that could basically, you know, say, I'm out of here, I know that my time has come, and I want to express that to you through this project. Yeah, all these cats out here owe it to Dilla Dog. All these cats. I mean, they found their own niche now. A lot of these cats are, he's been gone for, you know, a couple years now. So it's like, the teacher is gone. So you got to find your own style still, you know what I mean? But when he was around, and if he was still around, motherfuckers would still be biting whatever new shit he would be doing right now. While he was alive, he changed so many people's lives as it is. You know, like all my time with him, I was I always felt like, I'm in the presence of a li living legend. I tell a lot of people the first time I heard Jay shit is pretty much just like the first time I heard hip hop. I was like, I don't need to listen to pop music or any of that shit on the radio. This is what I want to do. LA certainly, like I said, had a, a, a reverence for Dilla that probably didn't exist in, in Detroit. I mean, I see it with Stones Throw all the time. You know, we go do a gig in LA, and I'm not saying that it's bad because we'll do great gigs in LA, but you show up in Paris and there's a, a line down the block. And I'm sure that, you know, Dilla saw a lot of that in L.A. when he first moved out. But the thing with Dilla in L.A. is that, you know, it, it persisted. It just never stopped. You know, like, people just had love for him wherever he went. But he was, you know, the great J.D. And, you know, he decided to spend some time in this city with us. And, you know, I, we're, we're all better for it. Yeah.